Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk while making stuff and maker culture. My name is Aaron, and joining me is... Joe. Yeah, and Christian is not here. Yeah. He was busy with work stuff. Yeah. But he's here in memory. We're drinking for him. <laughs> Somebody, yeah. I've been drinking plenty. <laughs> I've been drinking his share and mine. So tonight, we're in the podcast studio at River City Labs. Yeah. And it's not quite done, but it is far closer to done than it's been in the past recordings that we've done in here. Yep. It's warm. <laughs> it is warm. <laughs> Might I, have... bro- I brought that up to Josh last week. <laughs> Might have to go turn the furnace off for a second. <laughs> We had the door closed, and Chris and I came in here, and we're like, holy cow, Josh, you need to come in here. Because when we were building this, uh, it was warm out. So we're like, oh, it's too warm in the studio. We need to add more vents. So we have like three vents in here, and now it's winter, and the heater's going. It's like, wow, it's way too hot in here now. I'm going to go turn the furnace off. <laughs> okay. But there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Man, it's quiet in here. It's yeah, so great. It's really neat. I'm so excited to edit this episode. <laughs> so, Joe, what are you drinking tonight? I don't know. So, our uh, our our local beer creatory next to us gave me this can, and they're like, we don't know what's in it. There's a sticker on it, but we're not really sure what's in it. Have at it. So, um, yeah, let's find out. Take that, FDA. We don't know what we can. I don't. I don't. I don't know what this is, but I like it. What's it taste like, Mister Connoisseur? It's uh, it could be an APA. It could be a Kolsch. It could be. There's like, there's some things going on in this. Can I try, Mister Fancy Pants, who can't describe things. It's kind of hoppy. It smells hoppy. (laughs) ASMR episode, everyone. (laughs) You just... Well, it's a sweet... It says it's a sweet potato ale. That's what the sticker is, but they weren't sure if the sticker was what what it was. That is odd. Yeah, they have a sticker on top of their normal can. (laughs) There's not a whole lot going on. It's definitely hoppy. Yeah. It's got that normal pale ale type taste. I think it was an experiment. But I don't taste anything else. Yeah. Like it's it's a it's like a generic pale huh. ale thing. I'm gonna enjoy drinking it. Yeah, I mean it's not bad. It yeah. doesn't taste bad, it's just generic. Maybe it was an experiment. What are you drinking? I am drinking the industry uh compit, which is a dark red ale. Yeah, that stuff's good. And it was in the fridge. The can art for industry is so creepy. Do you know who they do? Who does it? Uh-uh. Because they're all really nice. And by nice, I mean creepy. Yeah, and they're, dark. Yeah, right I'd, up my alley. I don't know who does it, but they, I almost asked tonight, but then I didn't care. I think they need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> they need a friend. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so the the compit uh, art is some sort of butler, some sort of vampire butler with his head chopped off, and it's on a plate that he's carrying. Yeah, with a fork and a knife in his hands. So creepy, and it's like the art looks like it was inspired by the uh, scary stories to read at night books. <laughs> <laughs> that were, were like so quintessential for anyone who's in their thirties growing up. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's good stuff, though. It is good. So enough about beer. <laughs> we have a couple interesting news topics that we'd like to talk about. Yeah. Uh, one of them is um, Hackaday had a really interesting article on the uh, increase in robocalls. Which I'm sure a lot of us have been experiencing. Yeah, I know. I know this isn't a very makery topic, but like as soon as Aaron posted this in our chat that we talk about the podcast, and I got one of these, and then two more later in the day. So, 
Yeah. It's so such a relevant thing. Right it's now. not Mercury in in nature, but the problem, I think, uh, calls for a Mercury solution because it's such an antiquated and legacy system. The phone system is. Yeah. And most companies and cell providers are kind of they're slow to move, and they're they will only act in a way that will help themselves. Yeah. And I have heard a couple of really good solutions from some thought leaders in the security world. And I feel like this problem presents itself to a very makery solution, which is some sort of whitelist phone app that will act as a sort of answering machine. Yeah. And uh, as you get all any call, it will say, hey, here's the phone. You're calling, so you're calling Aaron, and he's using this new whitelist firewall app. Please press one, three, and nine, and it Ooh. may give random numbers. Ooh! Any human will be able to like, okay, one, three, and nine. All right, I am now routing your call. Yeah, and then it will go, f- and it will go through. Whereas it will be, it'll be a, so. If you think about the amount of effort required for the people who are using these ro- robo dialers, it's going to instantly disrupt all of their workflows. Especially because you could randomize that. That code exactly, yeah. It's it'll be it'll be different each time he gets called. Yeah. So that's a very makery solution for an industry problem that I don't think anybody's going to solve soon. Well, early on when Google Voice was like becoming a thing, you could do that. Like, you could say like, "All right, you 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 made this call to Joe, this who is using Google Voice, go ahead and press 1 to be routed through or press 2 to be routed to voicemail. And I don't think they have that option anymore. Um, I don't think so either. It's been a while since I messed with my Google Voice setup other than for voicemail, but um, it was very useful because uh, the business number I set up got spammed constantly. So, well, we have a Google Voice number for the makerspace, for the directors, and even then we have still getting a lot of robocalls. Yeah. I tried to set that up and i couldn't find it anywhere Hmm. but yeah so this article goes over um what they see as the reason why these rebel calls have increased and it's mostly because of the the ma bell breakup by the government they were seeing these the 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 bell corporate the conglomerate that they had too much pull over uh comm lines yeah and they were able to block individual calls say you're on verizon and verizon just sporadically blocked sprint calls. Yeah. Because they could. And they're like, well that's that's too much of a monopoly. You can't do that. But now they can't block spam calls. And that's where this is starting to come up through. Yeah. It's a hard problem. It, Cuz it, it's like, well how much control is too much control? And how much control do I want to give up to be rid of the Philadelphia health insurance scam scourge? Like <laughs> well, that and it's the same argument for trying to encrypt email. Yeah, it's a system that wasn't built for encryption, and it wasn't built for you know secureness. Yeah, and now you got this antiquated system that people are now exploiting, and they're using it essentially the way it was designed to be used, just not the way it was intended to be used. Yeah, and there's no way to set up the encryption and. Uh the handling without making it a giant pain. Oh, yeah. Like, you tried to send me that encrypted email today, and I was just like, <laughs> why is this so hard? This should be simple. That was super neat. It was fun, though. Yeah, so I, I recently signed up for a, a Tuta Nota uh, email account, which was a, an open source uh, end-to-end encrypted email provider. And you can send encrypted emails to people who don't have encrypted accounts. And what it does is it will send them an email saying, hey, Aaron sent you an encrypted email. Here's a link to your personal encrypted inbox. Yeah, and it gives it, it gave Joe a link to a to Denota, like temporary inbox, and then he had to plug in a uh, pre-shared password. Yeah. So I sent Joe a very personalized password this morning, <laughs> and uh, he he laughed because it was very inappropriate. <laughs> but so so he so he got presented with a login. And then once he put in the pre-shared password, he could then view the encrypted email. Yeah. So it, I'll admit it's, an, it's it's annoying if you don't have a Tutanota account because then you have to go through that whole process of logging in. But yeah, if if Joe also had a Tutanota account, like we could just send in fully encrypted 
and then it emails back and forth. But yeah. It was extra fun too because he sent the password first with no context. It was super fun. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, what? And then the next uh, news article we have is a guy named Beer. You know, (laughs) perfect for our show. Oh, yeah. He built this really cleanly designed a paper pulp 3d printer it's super clean design um yeah it's it's you know the the whole moving bed cartesian system but the the way he designed it was real slick and clean uh all with cnc routed plywood which is my personal favorite way to build 3d printers and everyone makes fun of me for it well he just did it better than joe no we didn't (laughs) he did it different (laughs) different but the, different can be better. <laughs> the paper pulp is pretty great. Um, I I I love the idea of people using renewable waste materials oh, for yeah. 3D printing because we're just generating tons and tons of plastic waste oh, yeah. with all of the Yoda heads that are floating <laughs> around in the world. All these benchies. But I love them all the same. And they, the baby groots. Yeah, all the baby groots and benchies and the and and the ultra heads, which is <laughs> a baby groot with a Yoda head and a benchy hat. Uh, <laughs> they're amazing. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll post links to that. You should definitely check out that printer and uh, his other designs that are linked in his blog. Yeah. Uh, all of his designs are super clean. I, I really yeah. enjoyed his. It's probably because he's, he's an industrial designer. So well, like, you know. That's kind of his thing is to make things look neat. I've seen some industrial designers that didn't make things <laughs> look that nice, all right? Yes, yeah, so it's a super clean design, and uh, he's actually using a really neat uh, screw-based plunger. Yeah. To So there's like off the printer, there's like an off-site uh, stepper-based, screw-based plunger that will push there's a piston that will push the pulped paper yeah through just looks like a generic tubing yeah it looked very similar to the uh clay extrusion system i saw at the milwaukee maker fair and i still need to get that interview out um but yeah he was using mostly off-the-shelf parts with a couple 3d printed parts Mm -hmm. it was uh, just polycarbonate tubing and a 3D printed plunger that had an O-ring. And then all the fittings were just gas fittings that he got at, like, Ace Hardware. Because he wanted it to be super accessible for mm-hmm. anybody uh, to be able to create with. So It was very uncomfortable to watch. Because there's, there's a video on the Hack of the Article, and it looks like it's just pooping out. <laughs> bulb Onto a wet base. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it just kind of slops around. But it works, and it works great. I wasn't uncomfortable <laughs> watching it print. It was the movement of the pulp through the tube that made me go, Ew. <laughs> it, was, it was great. I, I want to build one. I want to know how he pulped the paper. I want to know more about that process yeah, and the binder he, that he, he used. Yeah, that. Um, so. But, yeah. I Maybe he put it in a blend tech <laughs> and did, like, a will it blend thing. Yes. You know, I, I, I have one of those. Really? Yeah. Did you put an iPhone in it? I have not. So apparently, apparently the guy who did the Will Blend series took the normal Blend Tech, and they have, uh, like, voltage regulators yeah. built in. So, like, if you were to throw an iPhone in, it would sense, like, the overvoltage in the motor and, like, cut it. Okay. He took those out just so he could blend the iPhone and the other <laughs> things. But those were all sanctioned by the Blend Tech guys, oh, yeah. weren't they? Okay. Oh yeah, they, it was. Yeah, but I'm not gonna let you uh, blend an iPhone in my $400 blender. <laughs> it's so great. Uh, I don't think Costco will take it back after that. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. All right. So uh, with that, should we start on our topic? I mean, that's all the news we had. Yeah. So this topic's pretty near and dear to both of our hearts right now and uh as the last couple of months have been going on uh just tonight aaron and i have spent the last two hours at the maker space cleaning and organizing the space and i've been doing the same both at work and in my home workshop and uh it brought up the topic of are you a clean and organized maker 
or a chaotic maker or an organized chaos maker and you know which kind of organization system works for you in a personalized workshop or a um shared workshop like a makerspace or or work so um yeah so joe how would you categorize yourself well okay so i think if the people that i work with at work and at the space i guess ever came over to my house and saw my workshop they would go really why are you such a jerk at work because <laughs> my my personal workshop is just complete and utter chaos there's just crap everywhere and um you know, every time I start a project, I have to pick which tools I'm going to use and then clean them off because they've been utilized as a bench <laughs> for a different project. You know, it, it's it's ridiculous. But at work, I am very much a clean and organized um, worker uh, because when you're when you're sharing workspace with other people, uh, it's really really important that you know everybody continuously puts their tools back where they go and like kind of like everything has its place and everything goes in that place kind of mindset there's a bit more of a social onus that yeah because other people will be using this yeah we all need to be good stewards of that machine in that area that if you're going to use it make sure it's put back in the way it was before you used it right whereas at a home shop you're like i'm the only one using it I can put it wherever I want. I definitely remember that I left my two and a half millimeter Allen wrench on my print bed on the printer on the left. And, <laughs> you know, I know exactly where that Allen wrench is, but my coworker doesn't. So it's important that it goes back in the slot in the Allen wrench set. And the Allen wrench set goes back in the Allen wrench drawer and the drawer gets closed. Um, it's all about, you know, respecting the people that you work with and work mm-hmm. around and not just respecting them as people, but respecting their time mm-hmm. because nothing's more frustrating when you're in a hurry than spending 20 minutes looking for an Allen wrench, which is seriously my reality at work so much, <laughs> so much. And here in the makerspace. And that's been our culture at River City Labs for like the last three years is just like, insane chaos so when we moved here we've been really fighting for clean and organized and Uh everything has a home and that home isn't the workbench in the middle of the shop and if it is you better believe it's not going to be there yeah uh, we we've put a lot of effort into putting pegboard up in a lot of places and just about every other fixed machine has a board or two of pegboard behind it yeah with the idea that dedicated tools and materials and things that are used repeatedly can just be hung up by the machine. So when you're done using it, you just hang it right back up behind it. Yeah. Yeah, I used to hate that stuff. Like, um, if you've ever worked in an industrial environment, I've heard, sure you've heard of Six Sigma and <laughs> the five S's and the, the wastes. Um, but you know, when it, it, it becomes really important when you are, are sharing a workspace. But one of the things that um, I've been trying to uh, kind of generate culture-wise around here and at work is um, those workspaces shouldn't ever necessarily be thought of as rigid. So, like, the, the way we utilize the space today may not be the way we utilize the space in three months. Right. And we should be able to organically change the way the space is laid out based on how the space is being utilized. And uh, we made a layout when we first moved in with how we thought the best way the, the machines and all of our tools and kind of infrastructure should be laid out. And um, a couple of people got pretty married to that layout. Oh, yeah. And got really upset as we were going through and looking around at things and being like, you know, I don't think these benches along the walls are the right idea. Maybe maybe those should come down. Maybe we should do some benches perpendicular from the walls. And, uh, you know, a couple other changes like that. That's an interesting interesting relation. I know when we were moving, 
I know uh, Jim was really pushing for a layout. Hey, can we get a layout going so we can so we can plan? Yeah. So we can plan for the move. Where is where where is equipment going? You know, so we have a plan when we get things here and we know where it goes. Yeah. But then a lot of us were were uh, so like me and Ted, we were thinking about it. I'm like, you know, you could plan all you want, but once you get things in the in the space, they'll kind of tell you where they want to go. Yeah. And that becomes more of a planned versus organic mm-hmm. type mindset, which it's a little tangent to what the main topic is. No, and it's I, exactly what the main and, topic is. Yeah. And I, I, I thoroughly agree with Ted, which is we just need to get things over here. Yes. And then once we get them in the space, they'll kind of tell us and you'll get a feeling like, well, all the woodworking can go over here. But then where's the metals working going to go? Will the sparks interfere? Should we maybe space them out more? Yeah, and it's the things you don't really think about until you actually get them in the space and get them next to each other, and then you say, "Hey, that doesn't make much sense." Yep. And then, and then you then you react accordingly. Yeah, and like, um, and one of the things we changed around tonight was we initially had our panel saw against an open wall that you know, made sense in a layout because it was a hole that the panel saw fit in and we were able to load material in until I was working here one night and I was like, boy, that panel saw is right next to our laser cutters and there is no way to do it. Dust collection on the panel saw. And if you drop a panel, it's going to land right on a $4,000 laser cutter. Maybe we need to move the panel saw. And, um, you know, I came up with a, an, uh, a plan for where to move the panel saw and where to relocate the equipment where the panel saw was. And I felt really bad because uh, we had just placed uh, our CNC router, which is what we needed to move. And a lot of effort was done to wall mount the, the uh, monitor and you know, do infrastructure for the computers. But um, at the same time, I feel strongly that... The router is better placed where it's at now, and the panel saw is much better placed where it's at now. It's much easier to load. It's not going to throw dust all over sensitive equipment. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stand behind that decision when we change it again in three months. You know, it, we'll see how it goes. But um, I think organized chaos and organic chaos is, is really the right way to run a communal workshop. I like just calling it organic because yeah. it could be chaos, but there's a lot of communication that goes on with stuff like this. And as we move things, you know, people, you know, we'll get feedback in, in our Slack channels. And yeah. over time, I expect things to still be shifted around. But over the course of a couple of years, I expect things to kind of settle to where they will be permanently until we expand. Yes. And then things may then migrate. But yep. besides that, I like I, I like things I like to keep I don't like the plan because that's a lot of upfront effort and it may or may not actually work out. Yep. You know, and then in the end, if it's not just what you planned, then why bother planning? Why not just do it and then just everybody be flexible enough to just handle it as as we go. And that's pretty much how we handled the move. I ended up giving Jim pretty much was. a very rough idea of where I thought everything could go. And then I, I was actually glad I did the layout the way I did because it told us where a couple things could go and it told us that we very specifically could not fit a couple tools that a couple of members really wanted to buy. And uh, it gave me some ammo to be able to back up and be like, hey, we can't put a car lift in this space. <laughs> There's just no way. I know we have a garage door. But... As much as we all want a car lift. Yeah, as much as we all really want a car lift, not There's a chance. no space. <laughs> but I um, really want a car lift. Yeah. Yeah. We really want the guy behind us to move out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I think organic is a good way of putting it. Yeah. Now we've had um, one of our guys. Roger do an incredible job going through and getting our electronic tools super well organized. And those are things that need to be really well organized. But you know, at the same time, I, I'm looking at our 3D printer bench, which is still chaotic. And it's exactly how it needs to be. There, Everything's visible. Everything's able to be used. 
it's not overly organized. Um, but you know, it, people still feel comfortable working in it. Mm-hmm. And I, that's something that we ran into when I was doing the makerspace at uh, Caterpillar was it was so sterile, so clean. Nobody felt comfortable coming in and making a mess because it was <laughs> so apparent that they made a mess. Even though they were planning on cleaning it up, they just couldn't. There wasn't like nobody felt like they were able to go and and mess things up. So it was too orderly. Yeah, and it, it was funny because they have to like scan their badge each time they wanted to use a machine, and not while I was there. I don't know if it's gotten to that point. I know that was uh, planned at some point. I haven't signed up there yet because it's like way out of my way yeah all the way in mossville which is like i don't know 20 minutes away from here yeah like yeah. this is quicker than getting to the the cat maker space but they um they brought in some outside consultants and the first thing they said when the consultants came in was man this place is sterile how is anybody creating here <laughs> and it was such a, a gratifying moment for me because i'd been telling uh, all the managers this for so long and uh, have these guys that we paid to come here and, and visit and give advice to just like the, they walked in and they're just like, bam. It's like, yes, I'm not an idiot. Um, about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, to uh, another note though, like, I visited uh, the Milwaukee Makerspace while I was there for um, the Maker Fair at the end of September. And, you know, I walked in with a good friend of mine, and we were marveling at um, the organization of the space. But it was it was truly organized chaos because I could walk in there with somebody with a type A personality and they would just be shaking because of how uh, chaotic the space was. But it truly was super well organized. All the tools were visible and available. There wasn't stuff in the aisles. There wasn't crap all over the workbenches. You could use every tool in the space, but man, there was stuff everywhere. <laughs> and it was it was super fun to walk around and look at everything. And, um, you know, I was talking to uh, another guy that I met there, and according to him, the space was too clean. He's like, I couldn't get anything done in here. Everything just feels so sterile to me. <laughs> and you know, I, I, he's saying that as he's sitting on a workbench that's just covered in tools. And I was like, <laughs> man, there are, there are, like polarizing ends everywhere so um you know there's definitely those personalities that just like they can't function in one or the other or the middle and they just have to have things very specific Mm -hmm. so it's what are you oh gosh so at home i am very much chaotic it uh, I, it's just not even a comparison. <laughs> like my my basement is just a mess, which is where most of my workshop stuff is. And I have one shelf that I dedicate. It's like a standing shelf with multiple shelves where I dedicate to like all of the, all of my my DIY stuff. So I have spray paints, and then I have a section for adhesives. And have I have sections. I have sections of my shelves, <laughs> and they are very loosely defined sections. <laughs> That only I know where they are, and then and then it even goes on to the floor. There are sections on the floor by yes. the shelving where things go because I ran out of room on the shelves, and so I have I have spray paints and then I have adhesives. So I have like silicones and epoxies and Velcro and tape, <laughs> and then I have another section which is abrasives. So I have sandpaper and Scotch Brite. And how is that chaotic? What is, what is that? What is that? The the wire steel wool? Steel wool. All right. Of like the go. wire sponge. <laughs> <laughs> steel wool. And then and then another part that is just random stuff. And then the bottom I have giant paint things and 
stuff. But then on the floor, I have like all the stuff I use all the time is on the floor. So I've got I've got a little a little uh, a, a, one of those little toolboxes. So it's got like all the hand tools. It's got like my my needle nose pliers, my my main pliers, some you know a screwdriver with bits, and all the main stuff. And that's just in this little toolbox. They never take anywhere. It just sits there. And I take everything <laughs> out of it. And then I've got my 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 Walmart. I have this like some crappy Walmart toolbox that had like you know a socket wrench. Some basic sockets, basic bits, and I've been using that. Like that's what I learned how to work on cars on. It's like a twenty dollars kit. Yeah, but I still have most of the parts, and that just sits there open on the floor. And I just like throw stuff on it, and then I take stuff off of it, and like very very chaotic. But that's um, my computer area is pretty you know clean. Um, I have the laser engraver that I borrowed. That's somewhat clean. Right now, it's got all the parts for the the K40 bed that yeah. I'm working on, but you know most of my most of the actual like working areas are clean, but my supply and tool area is very just a mess. But it has sections. But like when I'm done with things, I just throw it in the section that it's supposed to be in, and then so I'm like, so I'm I'm looking for a, a screw that's in the the fastener area and i'm like <laughs> digging the fastener area and it's, it's various boxes of fasteners and screws and bolts and random bits that i've thrown in there so it sounds like your areas may be better defined as piles it is organic piles <laughs> they they are organized into piles and boxes and jars and mine is very similar yeah um yeah <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> Maybe, I, I I enjoy seeing other people's workshops and other people's organization, quote unquote, schemes as like how they deal with their their own mess. Um, you know, because uh, everyone's heard the saying like a a chaotic mind is an intelligent mind, and like your workspace looks like your mind kind you of know, thing. And, you know, the whole the whole joke with. You know, a cluttered, a cluttered workspace, you know, like, you know, at work. Yeah. You say, well, a cluttered desk is a cluttered mind. And I'm like, well, an empty space is an empty mind, <laughs> dingus. <laughs> Usually when people are like, a cluttered workspace is a cluttered mind to me, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know how many things I'm working on? Stop giving me extra things. Let me focus. Um, yeah, it's... It's totally true, though. I I do better when I can find things. Um, but a lot of times I'm just so pressed for time that I don't actually have time to clean up. And I'm trying to make this less of an excuse, especially at work and here. And I'm, like, building time into my projects to just clean and, mm. um, and pick up after myself. Because it, it really makes the next project so much harder to be like where is my drill this is an important tool why is it gone <laughs> this is my tool that i use constantly um so i'm trying to get better about that and i'm yeah i seem to get excuse to work on my organization because as you can tell i have like clearly defined sections for things i seem to get better at actually organizing them instead of having piles i need like dedicated you know paint area yeah that i can put all my paints and then i need better organizing for my adhesives and my screws and fasteners and especially all my tools i use a lot i really want to get some sort of i really liked um bob was bob from my i like to make stuff yeah he has a really nice video on a mobile pegboard based like rolling tool cart god i hate pegboard so much <sighs> <laughs> i want to make something like that where i can like actually have a dedicated space where I can hang all my stuff and it can actually roll around as I need it. Yeah. Because I like to organize things. I just I just don't I just don't currently have the, the place for them because I haven't I haven't spent the time to make a place for them. Yeah. So I just kinda like designate a shitty place for it and I just throw it there. My uh my my favorite um like makery person's tool organization is Adam Savage's dentist bag. Oh. That is on a, it's on like a scissor lift thing. What? 
It's so cool. He he found like a dude. Old... He has he has great videos on organization and storage, and I love his workshop. Yeah, it, and his workshop is like a really good example of excellent organized chaos. Everything's usable, but holy crap, there's stuff everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah, and you know, every time he needs something, he's like, oh, you know. <laughs> And he runs off to some <laughs> random corner. <Yeah. laughs> he pulls out this thing that he got at some like random junk store in 1981, and it's cataloged in his head, and it's amazing. I love These are it. called thrust bushings, <laughs> and they're and they're hidden in this other corner back here, and it's perfect for this application. Yeah. <laughs> it, Jamie's workshop's the same way. If you ever find a video where he's detailing his workshops, they're harder to find because you know he's not doing constant content like adam is but if you ever find jamie's workshop it's it's the same deal and um i i really enjoy uh both of them have good videos on how they build workbenches um a good workbench is like the key to a good workshop Mm -hmm. Um, having a bench that you can both hit with a hammer and move out of the way if you need to is just critical um especially when you're pressed for space Mm -hmm. and i think space is everyone's number one problem with organization. Hey, as makers, we tend to accumulate crap because we accumulate projects and then we accumulate supplies for the projects and then we accumulate yep. tools for the projects. Yep. But we never accumulate more places to put the stuff. So, and that was our problem in our last space is we, yep. we never really had enough room to expand all of the things that we had. We had so much stuff and not so much room. Mm-hmm. So when we moved to this space, we made a giant push to just throw so much stuff out. Like, we filled three, Dude. four dumpsters. Oh, yeah. Like, we were called for dumpster pickup almost every day for a week. Yeah, so it was like an extra 20 bucks for dumpster pickup, and we had our landlord, like, schedule, like, at least three or four dumpsters yeah. in a week. It was amazing. But, you know, it made our space so much more functional. Oh, yeah. Because... You know, we weren't carrying around all this extra baggage. And I spent a lot of time looking at things and being like, well, I should keep that around because I might need this. No, you won't. And that's, if you do, you're not going to be able to find it. That's why we had so much stuff to begin with. Yeah. We had industrial pneumatic, like, I don't even know, manifolds. Yeah. Like, if they were out of an industrial pick and place machine. Yeah. So, like, they're beefy things. And, and someone's like, these are super nice. We could use them for something. And then four years down the road, we never used it. And yeah. they just took up space on a shelf. And, you know, we might have been able to use it for something, but like, I, it takes a special person with a special project to utilize something like that because there's, there's knowledge that needs to be gained or had to utilize it. There's a very specific project for something like that, and it takes up a lot of room. It there, those things were heavy. Um, yeah, so it was, it was, it was, it was detrimental to the functionality of the space to keep mm-hmm. that stuff around. Um, you know, I was yeah. sad to let it go, but at the same time, I was happy to let it go because you, since we've moved here, there has been so much more creation oh, happening. Yeah. It's it, oh yeah, it's incredible. And I think it's due to, to two things. I mean, yeah, a lot of reasons other than just being more organized. Well, I mean, being but, more acce- this the location being more accessible to all yeah. kinds of people. But like, I I think a huge thing has been our push to organize the space mm-hmm. and to make sure the space is always clean and um, people aren't having to look for things constantly. As we were cleaning up the shop tonight we made a giant dent in what was left to be cleaned but i was having a ball running around and being like oh there's a place for these pliers and oh there's a place to hang these extension cords and you know it wasn't just like random rubbermaid tubs that we were having to chuck things in because that's where yeah it went it was all on pegboard yeah which is what joe hates i hate pegboard so much <laughs> you know it's, it's not pegboard that i hate it's the pegboard hangers and he their hates accessories. the pegboard represents yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm for against pegboard I, I i like that it keeps things visible and it gives things a place but i hate pegboard hangers and everything they represent like when i pick up a tool the tool container shouldn't come with it 
<laughs> All right? <laughs> Drives me insane. But, yeah. So, I think that's a, a nice, good, organic place to stop. Right? Got I more don't know. St- we can make it more chaotic and keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it will be so painful. <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm going to put this out there. I'm going to post pictures of my crappy workspace. And Ugh. the crappy workspace, that we, not crappy, the wonderful workspace that we have at the Makerspace and all of the things that we have done to make it better uh, on our subreddit. And you guys post pictures of your workspace. I'll post pictures of mine. You don't have to. I'll do it. You sound so of, sad. I'm going to do it out of solidarity because mine looks like crap. You're always like, oh, we need to set an example. <laughs> <laughs> as a makerspace, not as a podcast. Uh, but also as a podcast, we should be setting an example. Yeah. Damn it. All right. I was going to say, does that mean we can start editing this stuff in software that... <laughs> <laughs> no. So it doesn't drive me. To... All open source all the time. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, look for us on the subreddit, uh, Makers on Tap. Look for us on Instagram. And hey, we've got Twitter and YouTube now. So last week we did a really awesome interview with Sanjay from E3D. That is on YouTube. And uh, don't judge me. I'm not a video editor. I am. Barely an audio editor, but it went pretty good after some hiccups. Uh, but the audio is up in our all of our normal places, and it was a really super fun interview. Um, what do you got? Uh, I got nothing. Nothing? All right. Nope. I'm going to go finish this mystery I here. made that subreddit, so you can attribute that to me. Nice. <laughs> I made our Twitter, so you can not attribute that to me because it's not very good all right guys um keep making stuff yep this is the end of the podcast (laughs) right here midwest goodbye